Tēnākoto uh, katoa. Today I'm going to be, as uh, Fee said, I'm going to be discussing my experiences uh, during my PhD, uh, building a large corpus based on the official online version of uh, the New Zealand parliamentary debates, or Hansard, um, as well as an insight into the narrow institutional politics of parliament and political elites. As a researcher, I'm interested in the parliamentary record as a lens on society, culture, uh, history and ideas. Uh, why is this talk maybe relevant to folk in GLAM? Uh, for those involved in research on their collections or working closely with researchers, you might be interested in the corpus itself, and, but maybe more, more so in the methods that I've used. Uh, for people in, um, involved in putting collections online and content online, uh, you might be interested in some of the hoops that researchers have to jump through in repurposing digital resources and take this as encouragement to uh, continue engaging with the research community uh, in this work. I'll explain why there's a radio uh, in a bit. <laughs> but, um, so first I'd uh, like to, to, thanks, uh, to say thanks to NDF for having me, uh, and a big thanks to the University of Canterbury for funding my PhD research with a scholarship. Uh, my supervisors, Bronwyn Hayward in political science and Kevin Watson in linguistics, and my lovely colleagues at the Arts Digital Lab. Uh, representatives from the lab talked yesterday about the project Understanding Place, and the lab works closely uh, across the humanities, social sciences, and fine arts at UC, and has strong links to the GLAM sector. Uh, a bit about myself. Um, I have a professional background uh, dating back to 2000 as a software developer, um, working with web-based applications and web technologies. I ran a development shop in Christchurch. Um, my, my work on Hansard was part of my PhD research and in the postdoc position I'm going to be continuing uh, in the, to develop this and uh, apply um, to build other stuff and apply digital methods uh, for new research. Uh, that's a bit about, about myself, but um, the idea of speech with data, I'm going to get a, a green MP to introduce this idea, so hopefully the audio works. Uh, let's see. Nope. <coughs> Work. Okay. Uh, basically, this is a speech with Kevin Haig in the House uh, Representatives. Um, in it, he, he quantifies uh, the use of the word economy, the word growth and businesses in speeches by the National Party over time. He makes this point that, um, you know, the, the, the John Key isn't using the words climate change, isn't using the words poverty. And I want to use this as a way to introduce the idea of using speech um, as data getting it, kind of quantifying, counting it. Uh, so, and oddly enough, in my research, I based, um, I, was, I was studying the use of the word economy, and uh, I was applying um, methods developed by corpus ling linguists. Um, corpus linguist is, um, according to kind of the classic definition of it, uh, the study of language based on examples of real life language use. And so, uh, a corpus is a collection of a lot of texts, um, examples of language use collected together in a kind of a standardised format where there's no kind of stipulations about that really, um, but in a way that can be processed by a computer for analysis um, and, and maybe enriched with uh, further annotation. Uh, a basic claim of corpus linguistics... I'll untie my tongue. A basic claim of corpus linguistics uh, and a lot of digital methods is, is it's a way to surpass your in intuitions uh, about the data you're dealing with and identify meaningful patterns um, within it. So I was interested in pervasive patterns of use of a word like economy and to place it in perspective by drawing comparisons. So a bit about the PhD research that this was part of. Um, 
this uh, combined political psych psychology and corpus linguistics to examine the use of the economy in the wild. Um, and the, the wild, by wild I mean uh, parliamentary debates and I built a large corpus of 1788 hours of um, talkback radio. Um, I didn't listen to all that but I had some software listen to it. <laughs> um, there's a body of academic research uh, that's concerned with lay economic thinking and past research has been often uh, conducted by economists and, and economic psychologists and they focus on demonstrating the ways in which lay people deviate from the judgments and knowledge of economists and they typically see that as a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, or, you know, on the other hand, we've got, um, this tends to be the psychologists, they use in interviews and surveys to um, attempt to uncover hidden structures um, within our cognitions about the economic sphere. Instead, I was uh, focusing on observable language in uh, these contexts, connecting public thinking about the economy to the context of uh, political arguments and ideas, and studying common uh, features of argumentation to provide new insights on, on lay thinking as a kind of public thinking. So I'll talk briefly about the corpus. Uh, here's a photo of my, my son uh, reading a volume, and, but um, next to him there's a wall in, in the political science department at Canterbury of, um, of almost a complete uh, set of the, the print volumes. Uh, racing forward to kind of the present, obviously we have um, an online uh, version of this and the current uh, parliamentary website um, contains debates from 2003. Uh, at the time I started looking at the online Hansard in 2013, uh, it was quite slow to search and really wasn't conducive to, the, to cutting up in the kind of way I wanted to for my analysis. So my first instinct was uh, to look at uh, how it could be repurposed. So here I've got a representation of the source of the HTML and within it you can see uh, a bunch of markup um, marking um, particular kinds of speeches, uh, there's indications of timing, uh, even like the page that this would relate to in, the, in, a, in a print volume. Uh, the, the speakers are kind of represented in a, in a common way, so I thought this would be conducive to, to cutting up in some way. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but essentially, you know, the way a lot of people would, would approach this is to use an XML parser and use that as kind of the groundwork, but there was, there was a lot of inconsistency in the way that it was represented, uh, and it wasn't well formed in places. Um, I hope no one from um, Parliament's here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, they obviously over a 10 year period, which in 2013 I was, I was working with, there's things changed over time, the way that things were being marked up over time. There was a period of a week where it looked like their system went down and they were cutting and pasting from Word documents or something like this. Um, and you find all this, all this stuff out when you scrape. <laughs> um, so, so at the kind of the, the end of the, the software driven process to, to cut this thing up, um, there was a database containing all the separate utterances uh, and procedural text um, coded with the debate they were from, uh, the type of the debate, the, the date of the debate, and who was speaking and their party. And, and there was an initial stage of processing to uh, make searches and comparisons very fast. So over the, the, I updated it in 2016, and this is what I used for my analysis. So there was a 13 year period covered um, 57 million words, almost 400,000 utterances, and 261 speakers represented. So uh, I built a tool that, that went along with this. Um, this is why I was hoping. Okay, and similar to what Tim was saying, this is a raw working thing, you know. Um, I've, I, I developed it enough to do my analysis, um, but, it, but one, something I want to do through the postdoc is um, release a public version of this uh, for the public and researchers. So I'll, I'll kind of demo some of the basic kind of browsing. 
I thought I'd pick on librarians since. Uh, so, so this is kind of the classic um, Corpus Linguistics tool. Um, you know, when you search, the keyword is in context down the middle, and you get to see some text either side of it. And this is kind of the basic interpretive tool that even if you're using uh, uh, high-level qu quantifications, you're still kind of coming back to this to check the, the robustness of your of your interpretations. So, um, I'll pick out. One that I quite liked. Um, so you see, when you click one of these lines, it races to the point in, in the debate. Um, May the rage of a thousand librarians rain down on the heads of the National Party members. Um, I'm sure there's probably some people in this room that would agree with that. Um, sorry. Um, so. So um, part, of, part of the tool is it, it allows you to expand out the context to see things in the context of the debate. So in uh, question time uh, interactions, you can see the sequence of terms, um, you know, what, what people are responding to. And so this was a basic move in uh, the kind of corpus work I was doing is to look at levels of analysis, look at these big quantifications and down to the, the actual uh, utterance level. Um, one other thing that's quite... So I've made it so that you can highlight specific text in there uh, in the document, uh, and it'll create the concordance for that. Um, so I mean, I guess kind of similar to what Tim's doing, he's he's annotating his text with uh, linked open data. This is kind of a way to think of think of it as annotating the text with itself and kind of seeing context across the corpus, across lots of examples of usage. Um, at this point, uh, it's good to acknowledge that um, Tim's actually done some work on this. Um, he's built a, um, a tool for 80 years of the Australian Parliament, and uh, there's other people um, in the UK, the Hansard at Huddersfield Project. Uh, they're trying to make this more, more uh, useful for researchers and more accessible for the public. So, uh, what can researchers learn? Um, what, what can we do with this? Uh, so I'm going to take the case of economy um, uh, and, and talk about some of the, a small part of my research. Uh, firstly, in terms of use of economy, we can quantify its use over time and com compare it. Um, and here I've got, uh, this graph shows um, the average patterns of use by um, d three different parties and aggregated uh, over different parliamentary terms, um, and it's, it's an average uh, over every thousand words, so, so that you can directly compare them. Um, and so we can reflect back on what Kevin Haig was saying um, in, the, in the thing I couldn't play. Uh, he, was, you know, he was talking about the, the, the use of economy by the National Party, and obviously like in the period from 2008, there's a financial crisis and a change of government, it is a very uh, noticeable feature in comparison to the other parties. It increases dramatically. But interesting, also, before this 2008 period, National uh, comes behind Labor and, and the Greens and, and their use. Um, in addition to this, um, probably getting more useful for, for my research, uh, we, can, we can look at um, co-locations or words that predictably occur in a limited span um, with economy. And here I'm showing um, words that co-locate co across um, sentences across the whole corpus. Um, so you might expect words like gr um, to do with growth. Um, it gets more interesting when you compare parties on this. So you'll notice the two, two major parties have highlighted the common words between them, and particularly these top five words. I talked about a shared vocabulary, um, or shared language related to the economy. And, and also this kind of you know, I, dominant idea of growth and to be able to quantify this assumption that's kind of re prevalent in, um, in, in this kind of speech. Uh, the National Party members, um, when you, uh, said growth or one of the other grow words once in every four <laughs> sentences, um, Labor parties uh, use grow words 
once in every six sentences where they mention economy. Uh, the Greens, in, in contrast, um, mentioned it once every 20 sentences. So this, uh, and, and this was often in a, in a critical sense. Um, in addition, uh, I'm quite, I was quite interested in this word our, because the, the and this is our economy, the, the, the academic literature is focused on the emergence of this idea of that economy as a kind of a separate, abstract, independent entity that we, we do things for in our politics. Um, but, but along with this kind of abstract thing um, that, that, we're, that politicians were appealing to, they're also appealing to uh, our embeddedness, the, the embeddedness of the economy is for um, people in the end. So I've mainly talked about uh, language, but and moving away from the economy, um, the, you know, there's other things you can you can kind of take from this data. Um, graphs of this kind can't be, aren't a, you know, there's no data to, to to do this kind of stuff at the moment. So this is uh, looking at Green Party votes across years and the percentage of uh, yes, no's, and ab um, abstentions. And you'll see, so in the, in, under Labor, they were tending to vote yes more. Uh, under national vote, vote no more, um, but there's still this kind of you know strong no voting under Labour, which is quite interesting given they're in coalition now. Uh, also, I mean, we often talk about representation in Parliament and and equate that with who gets to speak and who has a voice. Um, so, there's, you know, using this data, we can we can look at who actually gets to talk, uh, you know, across parties, across genders, ethnicities, and so on. I mean, here I've picked out a party that I've, I've written a bit about, uh, the Greens, and so this is comparing 2006, where there's quite an equal share of speaker allocation, uh, to 2012, where there um, seems to be a more of a hierarchy. And these are patterns that you know, aren't, aren't kind of easily intuitable from, from just listening to Parliament. Okay, so what are the opportunities? Uh, the key... Uh, the key opportunity, uh, I think, is to e extend the span of the corpus. So I've stopped in 2016 when my analysis ended, but obviously there's this interesting period recently with a change of government. Um, but there's other sources of Hansard now going back um, to, to, the, to the earliest volumes. Um, there's been scans made available by the Hathi Trust. Um, there's a prior mirror of uh, previous uh, online uh, records prior to 2003, and I've recently noticed that there's um, some Google Docs link from the wiki that look kind of official as well, um, though I'm not sure um, of, their, of where they come from. Um, in addition to this, there's, there's videos that, um, that could enrich you know, the way that, that people uh, interact with this uh, kind of tool. So uh, joining these sources up and um, putting them into a comparable format across the entire Hansard uh, record would have lots of research applications. It's a challenge I've been looking at for a while. Um, prior to the Hathi scans being available, I piloted scanning and OCRing um, the debates myself, and thankfully this isn't something I have to worry about anymore. But I'll talk, talk about the challenges. First, uh, there's a basic problem of, uh, re of changing reporting practices. Uh, this is a problem that anyone working with Hansard needs to be aware of, that there's transcription and editing practices that change over time, and that's something researchers don't really know a lot about, especially once we get further back in time. Um, second, with, with different data sources, there's different representation practices, even just down to the way uh, columns, are, are, how many columns there are in the print version, uh, whether macrons were being used or, in one case, removed from one record, one, one record source, uh, and, and how we might identify speakers and procedural texts within uh, the OCR record itself. So I've, I've trialled um, using Bayesian classifiers to do this with some success. Um, thirdly, there's just some basic errors, both in bad scans in the scan record and uh, bugs in the online record which, as I mentioned, you probably only notice if you scrape it. Um, why should you care? Um, to put this another way, um, what can librarians, archivists, 
uh, and others in cultural heritage learn from this. Part of, part of my hope with uh, doing this talk is to provoke some interest in this form of analysis. I'm aware that there's university subject librarians at NDF and I would love to hear from researchers and others interested in the form of analysis uh, with Hansard or other sources. I'm also keen to provoke dialogue with people interested in the possibilities of collaborating uh, towards jo joining up the parliamentary record. I have this kind of rough idea of a wiki interface to crowdsource improvements to the scans, um, you know, to find p specific pages that are problematic um, and to correct the text of significant speeches. Um, perhaps we could discuss this more in question time. Also think it would be useful for folk in GLAM uh, to understand some of the problems that researchers have in repurposing data in the way I have. Um, especially as some of you will be involved with decisions about um, making stuff available. And many of you be, will be thinking, well, um, the answer is an API, and you know, if we build an API, <coughs> the researchers will come. And this is something you know, I've kind of been, been dealing with the Digital NZ API recently, which is great, and, but, the, but it's you know, interesting comparing institutions the way uh, the quality of uh, differs. You know, I was comparing, for example, uh, dissertation records across uh, university repositories, and you know, six out of eight of these institutions said what degree the dissertation was related to, two don't. So, so that, you know, that kind of leads me as, a, as, as someone who can code to, to start scraping that from the repositories themselves. Um, beyond, the, beyond the whole build it and they will come idea of APIs, uh, researchers need documentation on how the records were created and the decisions involved in this. This is things you'll, you'll know, but this is something that probably can be best achieved by by continuing the dialogues with the research community. And uh, this is perhaps an encouragement to continue these engagements. So uh, I'll leave it there. I had something else to play, but that'll do. We've got time for one or two questions. Any questions out there? Oh, Tim's got one. That's great, Jeff. Um, I mean, my question's sort of obvious, and that's um, the possibilities of international comparisons. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we have the Australian Hansard, even though there's some licensing issues around it. I think Canadian Hansard is available yeah, now. Yeah. So I'm wondering what, what you think, the, the, you know, what it might emerge if we can start to actually explore these different bodies of political speech across countries. Yeah, I think that would be, I mean, the, the economy is, I mean, this is interesting from my, my own research, but I think this would be, you know, it would be interesting to see this across, across um, in, in comparative kind of context. I, and one of the things, I've, I've looked at the Australian con um, records and I kind of played around with that um, a wee bit. And, you know, there's, there are some problems of kind of comparing formats. Um, but, yeah, I think this is, you know, there's some people already doing this kind of stuff. I know I'm aware of some can Canadian researchers that did stuff uh, with European parliaments, but um, yeah, there's kind of a wide open kind of field really in terms of these comparisons, yeah, yeah. Kia ora, Geoffrey. Um, you mentioned problems with uh, documentation and um, the source and the markup. Did you think of contacting the Office of the Clerk and asking them about the um, that, inconsistencies? I did think of that, but I'd kind of done it already. I mean, this is kind of the, the, the hacker thing, um, is just kind of do it and, um, you know, kind of solve the problems as much as you can uh, yourself. And, and I, I would, I'd really like to talk to the Hansard team about some of the, the things I'd found with this, um, you know, found one little bug that I'm sure they'd love to know about. Um, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, um, and I, I mean, it's just, it's a big reflection on their work as well. You know, when you work with this for a, a number of years, it's, you see the amount of work that's going in to put this thing together, so, yeah. Someone. 
Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Rowan Payne, Digital NZ. Um, just to follow on from that uh, pre that previous question, I just put put it out there that also, um, you know, issues with um, with what you find through the Digital NZ API, you know, we can we can also work with that. Yeah, I, I yeah. appreciate that. That's you know. Oh, that wasn't a criticism at all. I sent an email off about something else and got a nice prompt reply. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> it's the nature of the thing, and I mean, my point is really that you know the API is kind of you know it's it's about what data you're exposing and how, and you know researchers you know are, shouldn't really you know I don't want to be constrained necessarily by by the particular ways of classifying those records. So um, you know I've kind of got the privilege of being able to code around it, but um, but yeah, I guess it speaks to how how the APIs are, um, what, what's being exposed, yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering how far can you filter it? So you can do it by parties. Could you do by like individual MPs and analyze their specific language and use of words? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I've done a little bit of work with this with John Key. Um, and, and direct comparisons with Helen Clark. You know, so, so there's kind of a particular speech that kind of belongs to prime ministerial roles and then it's, it's working out what, what's different. Um, and yeah, this is something that um, I think you can do it with the Hansard search now is bring up individual speeches by, by parliamentarians, but um, at the time I kind of kicked this off, you couldn't. And um, yeah, just, just being able to see all the speeches um, you know, decontextualize across time one speaker, up, you know, speech after another is quite, quite useful, yeah. Is anyone from Hansard or the Parliament here? Oh, sweet. I'll talk to you afterwards, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. I was going to ask exactly the same question because I had an inkling there was probably someone from Parliamentary Library or, um, or from Parliamentary Services in the room, or at least NDF, and um, I think by the number of questions you can tell that you've got a pretty engaged audience and I can think of several people, some of whom are in the room, who you need to talk to. Uh, so hit me up afterwards oh, oh. and um, yeah, um, really exciting work and I'm, yeah, there's some people for you to meet. Oh. Um, Okay, everyone, it's lunchtime. Can we homo tapaki paki for Jeff? Thank you.